This presentation is the basics of networking fundamentals. It's a broad overview, very generic, uh, pretty much everything that you might learn in a first year networking class all compressed into one short presentation. And I'm going to really concentrate on TCP because that's the most commonly used, but I'll talk about some of the other protocols that, that surround it. So let's start with the TCP model. Almost every networking textbook that you read or that you look at, I've got a whole bunch on my shelf back here. They almost always start by talking about the OSI model and this idea of these layers that are abstracted from one another. And the textbooks are right that it is a lot about abstraction with, with, the, uh, with the OSI model. But the thing about OSI is it's not real. It was never really implemented anywhere. Uh, the actual model that was implemented was the TCP IP model. And what a lot of the textbooks I see, uh, you know, and a lot of instructors I'll see will talk about TCP IP as being uh, sort of a derivative of OSI. And I would, I would argue that it's not a derivative. It's a completely different standard altogether. It's not based on OSI. Uh, a lot of times I'll hear people say, well, TCP IP only has five layers instead of seven. And layer five really encompasses seven, six, and five in the OSI model. And that's really not true. There is no presentation or session layer in TCP IP. And I would argue that a lot of that functionality for things like session, uh, what you find in session in the OSI model is actually in the transport layer in TCP. So it's not as simple as just saying, well, you collapse those layers into layer five uh, in TCP IP. It doesn't really work that way. So let's forget about the OSI model, right? The real model is TCP IP. Don't worry about trying to remember what the OSI model is and how it works. Now, if you take a lot of these certification exams, they're going to tell you that you have to know uh, the OSI model, that you have to know the layers. And of course you do, we all have to go through the motions, but in the real world, it's completely useless. Um, TCP IP is basically all we've got out there today. It's the only real standard that we use in networking. So let's talk about TCP IP uh, and how it works in this this uh, concept of encapsulation, which is really important for TCIP. I use the term abstraction when I talked about the OSI model, um, but really it's in, in TCP, it's this concept of encapsulation with these different layers. We're encapsulating within each layer as we go uh, up the stack, right? And as we're going down the stack, we're uh, either encapsulating or de-encapsulating uh, these different types of things. So let's talk about what this is. So starting at the application layer, if you had some data that you wanted to send over a network. I'm just going to use the example foo, right? If I have some data at the end of the day, all data is nothing more than uh, ones and zeros, right? We can encode that in this case, foo can be encoded into hexadecimal, which can be converted very easily into binary, right? It's uh, you know, it's, um, it's ASCII equivalent and then the binary, right? So at the end of the day, it's all just ones and zeros. I don't really care about the data in this topic, right? We're not really talking about applications. We're talking about networking. So we're just going to abstract that as data. That's it. We're going to refer to it as data. So if I have some block of data that I need to send from point A to point B, the first step is we have to, when we drop to the transport layer, we're going to encapsulate that with what's called a segment. The segment has a header and a footer, and there'll be information in the header and the footer that help us decipher what to do with that segment at the transport layer. Then that gets passed down to the network layer where it's encapsulated once again, and we now call it a packet. So there's a header and a footer, and now that, that, you know, that datagram is now called a packet. And then we pass that once more down to the data link layer where we now call it a frame. So you're gonna hear the term segment, packet, frame, and then just data. Here's the thing is almost everyone just uses the term packet, right? But a packet is something very specific. A packet is at the network level, right? It's a network layer datagram. If we're talking about the transport layer, we're talking about a segment. If we're talking about the data link layer, we're talking about a frame. So these things are all different terms, but again, a lot of people use packet to describe all of them, but let's be precise in our language when we refer to these. So I'll refer to these from here out in this presentation as either a segment, a packet, or a frame. And you can reference this diagram, obviously the segment as that one header and footer, packet we tack on another header and a footer for the transfer for the network layer and then at the data link layer with a frame we put another header and a footer on to create our frame at the data link layer and of course all the way at the bottom at the physical layer it's really just ones and zeros right it's we're encoding that data somehow to transmit it across a wire wirelessly through various medium and there's different standards of course that support all that stuff I'm going to talk mostly about the network and data link as well and I'll also talk about transport of course in this uh in this slide deck. So really going to concentrate on four, three, and two, right? So transport network and the data link layers. 
Um, the reason I highlighted those for you is uh, those are the network and data link layer are inherently unreliable connectionless. There's no multiplexing. I'll talk more about what that means here in just a few minutes. So let's start with the data link layer. Actually, we're going to look at all these layers, right? There's different protocols at all these different layers. Uh, you could take courses and learn all about all these different physical uh, layer protocols that IEEE defines, like 100 base TX, 100 base FX, base FX, 100 base T, 10 base T, right? It's uh, I'm using all the old ones here. There's obviously much newer ones. I'm not really up on the physical um, on the the physical standards and the IEEE standards, but obviously there's a whole bunch of them, right? Uh, at the uh, at that physical layer. So this is the electrical sort of, you know, the signaling layer uh, at the physical layer. But then as we go all the way, as we start to move up, right, at the network layer, you've got um, IPX, Novell, and IP are pretty much the only two that are really left that are common. Uh, although sometimes you'll hear about things like uh, token ring, right? Um, but at the, uh, but IPX, Novell, I have this on the presentation because it's still out there in some places, but incredibly rare. We don't really see a lot of folks using IPX anymore, Novell. It's almost all just IP at this point at the network layer. Um, but at the data link layer, you'll have things like 802.3, which is Mac, uh, pretty much the de facto standard at this point. Almost everyone's using 802.3 Mac, and that's pretty much it, which could work with either IPX or IP. Uh, but there are other standards out there like 802.5 TR, that stands for token ring, for those that remember that from many moons ago, right? That was a... Um, an IBM standard token ring. And there was other standards that would support that, that would allow that to work with IP or with IPX. Again, most of that we're not seeing anymore, just so you're aware of the vernacular and you see it, right? Really what we mostly see in the real world is IP layer. That's pretty much it. All the other stuff on here, you probably will very rarely see, but it's good to be aware of it. Um, so we're mostly going to worry about the IP layer at the network layer. At the data link layer, we talk mostly about 802.3 MAC, which is an IEEE standard. And likewise, at the physical layer, you know, all those various signaling standards in IEEE at the physical layer. So IP and 802.3, again, is what we're going to concentrate on. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the data link layer, that, that second to bottom layer. Right? I'm not going to talk too much about how the physical layer works. Um, you know, that's a whole different engineering discipline. We're talking mostly about IT here, right? Uh, but at the data link layer, you know, let's say I've got four computers on my network. Each one of those computers on my network is going to be connected to a hub. This is in the old days, right? It would be a hub. But just to understand the concept here, every device has a physical address. The physical address contains two parts. The first part of the physical address, these are hexadecimal, right? Uh, so that's why there's letters and numbers here. So it's zero through F, zero through A, B, C, D, E, F, right? Um, 16 characters. The first half is uh, usually assigned to manufacturers. The second half is uh, a serial number for the individual device. They're supposed to never repeat in the real world, although sometimes it does happen. Um, as long as it's not on the same network, you know, if they're natted behind a firewall, it's not a big deal if you've got two uh, devices out there on the world that share the same MAC address, right? The same physical address, but it's very rare uh, when it does happen inside a network. Of course, it's going to ruin your day, but hopefully that doesn't really happen too often. Um, but anyway, so each one of these devices is going to have an address, right? So you can see here, I've got four computers. Each one has a unique physical address. Uh, each one of these devices, if, if the device on the left wants to send a message to, say, the device on the right, um, first of all, there's going to be a, if you recall, this is a frame, right? So you're going to have a frame header that's going to have the origin MAC address, which is A, and the destination, which is 3, which is the one on the right-hand side. So we're going to send that information. Uh, it's going to get, in, you know, encoded on the, uh, say, you know, somehow on that physical layer. Unfortunately, with a hub, a hub is a very dumb device, so it's just going to repeat to everyone exactly what it hears on one port. So everyone is seeing the same thing it's connected to that one device which is not very efficient so at some point um you know and you, really what happens here is the machine on the right hand side is going to see that there's traffic intended for it and it's going to receive that information now this is very much like if you're sitting in a classroom with other students and uh you know you want to tell somebody in the classroom something you have to say their name and everybody else can just not listen they're going to hear it but they don't necessarily have to listen to the message right um, so again, it's not very efficient because only one pair can talk at the same time. So you can't really get a lot of utilization out of all those connections, right? So there's a much better way to do this. And 
we switch to a device called a switch. And what that does is it's smart enough to know that when traffic comes in on a certain port, it looks at the origin and destination and makes sure that the information is only sent to the intended destination. And meanwhile, the two in the middle could also be having their own conversation and it's all within their own four walls, right? So this is a much better way to do this. So in modern networking, we typically see switches implemented at the data link layer. Very simple, right? This is a, a relatively simple standard. The addressing is very simple. Uh, it's not routable beyond networks. You know, it's only understood within a, a, a finite area. Now, if we fast forward a little bit, then we get to the network layer. Now it starts to get a little bit more complicated. So at the network layer, um, so encapsulated inside that frame, we're going to find a packet header. And that packet header might contain something like, um, as you see here, it's going to have a whole bunch of stuff. But the thing we're most interested in in the packet header is going to be the source IP address and the destination IP address, right? So that's the network address. Uh, you know, the, the network address of the, of the node that we want to communicate with. So first we have that data link layer on the outside and we have that network layer inside in the packet layer. Let's see what this looks like in the real world. So if you have an IP address, this is what they look like. A little more complicated than a data link layer address, right? Than a MAC address, for example. Uh, they're, they're called octets, right? They're made up of eight bits. That's why they're called an octet. Um, so basically you have uh, uh, these octets, which so when they're strung together, you have an IP address. It's again, nothing more than ones and zeros, right? Uh, one of the concepts with IP addresses is that a portion of the address signifies the network and the other portion, the suffix, signifies a node within that network. You can almost think of MAC addresses a little bit like phone numbers in that a phone number has an area code, an exchange and a line number, right? So there's this broad area code which covers a large geography and then you have you know, other parts of that number that zero in on a specific dwelling unit or a specific business that has a telephone, right? And IP addresses are somewhat similar. So you have this kind of broad network address and then within that, all these unique addresses um, within that network. And we'll talk about NATing later on and how that works. But one of the interesting things about IP addresses is that the delineation between the network portion and the suffix or the node portion is not fixed. It can be, it can shift across that dotted decimal. In my first example, the, uh, the network portion of the address is 24 bits, but we could also change it to just be 22 bits, for example. And that is called the subnet mask. Uh, that, that indicates the subnet mask is what tells you what portion of an IP address tells you it is the network portion and the delineation to where the node portion begins. So that's what you're seeing here. Sometimes this is called CEDAR addressing. It's defined in RFC 4632, which you can go and read about this and learn how to do this and learn how to do subnetting. A lot of uh, networking classes will spend an entire week discussing this. Now that we know a little bit about both the data link layer and the network layer, now let's take it one step further and show a little bit about how this works together, okay? So let's say I've got a bunch of computers on a network. On that network, I'm gonna have switches. We already learned about switches. Now, there is another device that we have to have when we start talking about networks, which is going to be a router. So a router goes in the middle. Now we have two different types of addresses now that we have to worry about. We have the data link addresses and we have the network addresses. So in this example, let's say I, you know, look at my packet header and my frame header. My, according to my, my packet header, my source IP address is 10.11.12.13 and that is the computer that you see all the way on the left side of the diagram. My destination IP address is 172.20.21.22. That's the computer all the way on the right side of this diagram. The frame layer, when that computer on the left hand side wants to send that packet to 172.20.21, very similar to how you send a letter in the mail, when the postal service picks up that letter, there's going to be a zip code on it. If the letter is destined to somebody that's not in your zip code, it's going to go to somebody that can route it to the right zip code, right? All you need to know if you're the letter carrier, when you get that letter, as you look at it, you say, this is not somebody on my route. This is not somebody in my town. So it's going to go or in my zip code. So it's going to go to somebody else who can sort that out. And that's what we call a default gateway. The default gateway is where can I send information? Where can I send these packets where they can sort out where they need to go, right? They have the intelligence to know how to get it from point A to point B. So the first step is my computer is connected to a switch. 
my source IP or the MAC address is A, but I set the destination to A3 because that is my default gateway. 10.11.12.1 will be defined as the default gateway in my network. So whenever packets arrive at that default gateway, it can sort out how to get it downstream to other systems. So let's take a look at how that works. So the first thing that's going to happen is our packet is going to get sent through the switch. Uh, the switch is obviously going to know how to get to the router. It's going to land on that router, and the router is going to look at that, and it's now going to mangle that frame. Uh, what I mean by that is it's going to modify the frame header because the source and destination are going to change. The source MAC address is now going to change to the router's MAC address, and the destination MAC address is going to change to the computer that's all the way on the right. So that information gets modified. It gets changed in order to reflect that. So you can see here that we've changed the MAC address. I think I actually have it wrong, but, uh, but I think you get the idea. All right, so once that happens, the machine all the way on the right is going to receive that, uh, that datagram. It's going to receive the frame in the packet. It's going to flow back up to the application layer, and we get that information. So that's roughly how the data link and the network layers work together. Now let's start talking about the TCP layer. The things get a little bit different here, a little bit more complicated because we have to support more stuff here at the data link layer. Um, so we already talked about these various standards. There are two standards at the transport layer. There's TCP and the other one is UDP and there's a whole bunch of protocols within both at the application layer. For example, SSH is typically a TCP protocol as is uh, Telnet and uh, HTTP, right, the web. The reason that they fall under TCP is reliability is important, multiplexing is important. I'm going to talk about what that means. Uh, and then at UDP, um, DNS, SNMP, where reliable is, reliability is less important. Voice over IP, for example, and video streaming might be UDP protocols in some networks and some protocols. So what are the goals of TCP? These are defined in RFC 793 uh, all the way back in 1981 by John Postel. So he defined these goals of, you know, we have this, this uh this ip layer stuff these network protocols how do we make that more reliable and the idea was to layer on top of that the transport layer which would do that a um, couple things that the transport layer needs to do it needs to have basic data transfer so the tcp or the transfer control protocol is able to transfer a continuous stream of octets in other words data uh, in each direction between its users by packaging some number of octets in the segments for transmission there's the term segment right um, reliability, it has to be able to recover when data is damaged or lost or duplicated, right? So that's where we start to see that reliability. You have to have flow control. You don't want to overflow. You don't want to send information too fast um, to another node, but you also want, don't want to send it too slow. You don't want to overwhelm it, but you don't want to send it too slow, right? Just like in a classroom when I'm teaching, I have to be cognizant that I don't want to deliver the information so fast that a lot of the students aren't getting it, but so slow that the majority of the students are getting bored, right? So we have to have that balance and flow control is what allows us to figure out the right speed to transmit the data between nodes. If you think back to that other slide where I showed all these different, uh, different things that we can communicate on a computer, right? You have all these different protocols at the application layer. Well, without multiplexing, only one would be able to use the network at any given time. So what TCP does for us is it gives us a mechanism to multiplex. You can think of this using the telephone analogy. You have one phone number for the building, but within the building, you have different extensions, right? So it's like these different extensions. So everybody's got a phone on their desk, but they have their own extension. That's why I pick up my phone on my desk. I don't hear someone else's conversation. It's not a party line from 1975. You know, we've certainly progressed a lot since then. And then we have to have this concept of connections. It's the reliability and flow control mechanisms that require TCP to initialize and maintain a connection between two nodes. In other words, I can establish a connection and then that connection remains persistent throughout the communication. So it, it's sort of like, again, going back to the telephone analogy versus a postcard. You know, with a postcard, I write out the postcard, I send it in the mail. There really is no concept of a connection there. Uh, it's sort of just broadcasting that information to somebody to go and pick it up. I don't really have a conversation, but to have a conversation, it's more like a telephone. I call somebody, they pick up the phone, we have a conversation, and then we both hang up the phone when we're done. So that's the concept of a connection. So TCP has to support that. The network layer inherently does not support any of this stuff. So we have to have the transport layer to get these features in that TCP IP stack. 
Finally, there's precedence and security, which is not commonly used. Uh, I'm not really going to talk too much about that. It's not really important for you to understand the TCP uh, protocols. So let's talk about a segment. What exactly is a segment? How does it work? The most two most important things in a segment that most people look at is the source port and the destination port. These are um, anywhere from 0 to 65,000, right? So it's a 16-bit number, each one of them. For example, um, I could set my source port to something like 2791 and my destination port to something like 80, meaning that I'm trying to send information to a web server. Below that in the, P, in the TCP segment header, you'll have a sequence number. Uh, and we'll talk more about sequence numbers in a second. They're much larger numbers, right, as you can see here. Uh, but they're unique, right? A sequence number is unique to every single segment in a connection. And in order to establish that connection and begin the sequences, we have to also have acknowledgement numbers. The acknowledgement number is how I tell somebody that I received a previous segment, and it tells the other set, the sender, what that uh, seg that sequence number was of the previous segment. Um, again, that's a pretty big number. Then you have a four-bit data offset. You have some uh, three bits of reserve that are not used, and then you have flags. The flags indicate what type of segment this is. Are we trying to establish a connection? Are we tearing down a connection? Is it acknowledgement? Uh, you know, exactly what are we doing, right? So that's what the flags tell us. Um, so that's another eight bits of flags. And then you have the window size. The window size tells how large the segment is allowed to be. How big or how small do I want that segment? So typically the receiver is going to say, here's how big of a window I can support from you based on my available resources. Then you'll have a checksum, an urgent pointer, uh, again, these are both 16-bit um, 16, uh, 16 fields, some additional options, and some padding. I'm not going to talk about these other fields. The important ones are the ones that you saw above that. So that's basically what makes up a segment header. So you can start to kind of start to get a feel for all the information we can cram into that segment header that helps us establish uh, all of those goals that we talked about in the previous screen. Let's talk about how a TCP session is created. So we start with a server or a client and a server. The uh, server is basically going to be listening. Our client wants to communicate. It's going to send a SYN packet first or a SYN segment first. So a SYN is a request to create a connection. We're going to set the SYN flag, right? So what you're seeing here on the diagram is the flags. This is a packet with the SYN flag set. It's going to have a value for the sequence number. There won't be an acknowledgement because we're not acknowledging anything yet. We're just establishing that we want to create a connection. And here's my first sequence number. The receiver is going to then send back a segment with the SYN and the ACK flag set, and both the uh, it's going to have both its SYN, its sequence number set, and you, the acknowledgement field will be the sequence number that you initially sent, saying, I got your request for the connection. I'm acknowledging your segments or your sequence number, and then I'm also sending you what my sequence numbers are going to be in the, SIN fl in the uh, sequence uh, field. And then you're going to respond with an ACK message saying, I received your message. Here is your sequence number in the acknowledgement so you know that I have it and I'm ready to establish this connection. At this point, our connection is now established and we populate both the ACK, um, uh, so we populate both the, um, uh, this, the ACK and the data flags and we send the data back and forth. We're doing both. We're sending data with our sequence numbers and then somebody sending back the acknowledgement that they got it and vice versa, right? We're exchanging messages back and forth with the sequence and the acknowledgement numbers. When we're done, the uh, somebody's going to send the ACFIN flag set, right? So the acknowledgement flag is set saying, I acknowledge the packet that you sent me. Here is uh, the FIN flag is going to be set saying, I am finished. I have nothing else to send you. And then they're going to acknowledge that by sending back an ACK. And then they're going to send their own ACK fin to tear down the connection. Then you're going to acknowledge that you got their indication to close the connection. At that point, the connection has been closed. And this is what the whole process looks like. So in this process, basically, we say that the server is in a listen state. So when we first start up in, in TCP, it's at a listen state. Then we're in a sin sense state. Then we, then we transition to an established state. Then we go into fin weight one, fin weight two, time weight, and then closed. Typically, when you go into a system and you run the command to look at these states, that's the netstat command in most systems, whether it's Linux or Windows or Mac, um, typically you're going to see either a listen 
or established. The other ones are very ephemeral. They're very short lived, right? So they're not going to last very long. So you're going to typically you're going to catch them in either established or a listen. Or if there's a broken connection, you might see time wait, right? It's waiting to, to, to break down that connection. And sometimes they'll just wait for a period of time and then just close the connection because they're not going to get back to you. So let's talk a little bit about firewalls now that we've talked about the standards. Um, if you think about firewalls and networking security, we have a lot of stuff we can work with in firewalls. Just from what I told you at the data link layer, we know which physical device it should have come from, which physical device it's supposed to go to. Uh, we know the protocol, right? Typically 802.3. At the network layer, we know the source and destination IP addresses. We know the protocol version, either it's going to be four or six. I didn't talk about IPv6 in this presentation, um, but that's a whole other presentation that you could watch. Uh, again, most in most local area networks, we're still using IPv4 for a variety of reasons. Um, in the larger WAN, a lot of times we're using IPv6 now because of the finite number of IPv4 addresses. And then at the transport layer, we have uh, the source port, the destination port, the various flags and the connection state and all of these things we can use for intelligence about what to do with these datagrams as they're traversing through our firewall at the network layer or in the network rather with network devices specifically firewall so firewall rules typically will use something like the destination port the destination ip address um, so for example we could say allow all traffic going to tcp port 80 on ip address 68 68 68 we can block everything on port 25 going out to the internet right so we can use this various information and build lists of rules Rules can evaluate any combination of the information that you saw in the uh, various headers, right? Whether it's the data link layer, the network layer, or the transport layer. Typically, network firewalls don't really dig too much into the application layer, although there are application firewalls, things like proxy servers, for example, intrusion detection systems, you know, they'll typically look into the application layer. But in a network, you know, in network security, we typically talk about these three layers. So the segment header, the IP header, the frame, and so forth um, and then we have the target and source destinations the connection state the actual payload again it's unusual but you could there are two types of firewalls uh, or firewall rules there are what we call stateless firewall rules they're only applied to one packet at a time traversing the firewall it has no understanding of the state of a connection um, a sequence of packets is not considered we're just looking at what's in front of us right now uh, and i always like to think of this as sort of like a traffic cop uh, you know, a traffic cop on the corner, they're looking at the cars in front of them and telling them what to do. You know, they're, they're making decisions about what to do for each individual car in the moment on the street, right? Uh, that's kind of like a stateless firewall. There's not really a lot of thought behind it. They just have some basic rules of you go over here and you're going to go over there, right? But then when we transition into a stateful firewall, this I think of more like a detective. Uh, they can see the bigger picture. Uh, you know, they're taking notes and they're trying to put it all, put everything all together to understand what's happening and then make a decision. Um, so it's based on a little bit more information, right? So I think of stateful as being sort of like a detective as opposed to a patrol officer directing cars on the street. When we talk about firewall rules and state, just to show how this works, if I can track state, if I get a packet, and then I send an acknowledgement. You can see here with the sequence numbers, right? There's a sequence number and an acknowledgement number. Um, and I just made them slightly different series here. So you can tell, you know, one is starting with one, the other one starts with a thousand. And I can start exchanging messages and we're getting back and forth these sequence numbers and these acknowledgement numbers to establish the connection, to start exchanging data and so forth. So the firewall can really start to have an understanding of exactly uh, you know, of, you know, how this connection is working because of those sequence and the acknowledgement numbers, right? It kind of knows that this is all an established connection. But if a bad guy comes along and tries to insert their own packet with made up sequence and acknowledgement numbers, the firewall is smart enough to know to drop that packet because it obviously doesn't belong to this connection. It makes spoofing attacks much more difficult. You'd have to know what those sequence and acknowledgement numbers are. There are different types of uh, firewalls. You know, usually when we talk about network firewalls, they kind of fall into two categories. You have your Unix, Linux, and BSD based firewalls. And these typically use tools like IP tables. IP tables is the de facto standard of firewalls in Linux. 
almost every package that does firewalling is probably using IP tables somewhere under the hood. IP tables has uh, been around for a long time. It's a core component in the Linux kernel. Every Linux kernel has IP tables. It's uh, again, it's part of the core of the Linux kernel, not part of that, you know, the uh, the componentized portion of the uh, of the kernel. And then you have another category, which is Cisco. And you know, at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned, most firewalls are going to fall into one of these two categories. You have the proprietary Cisco and pretty much everybody else. And you look at the Barracudas of the world and the F5. You know, at the end of the day, most of them are using IP tables under the hood. I would argue that probably almost all of them are. Why would you reinvent the wheel? IP tables does everything that you need. The hard thing about IP tables is configuration, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And that's kind of the value that you get in a lot of those network devices is the uh, configuration tools. So let's talk about Cisco first, though. So a Cisco firewall rule is actually relatively simple. You have an access list. And then the rule is either going to permit or deny traffic. And then you give it a pattern which contains things like whether or not it's IP, uh, TCP or UDP versus ICMP, the source IP address, the mask, the target IP address and mask, uh, the port number, for example, whether it's equal to, greater than, or in a range of port numbers. And that's pretty much it. So where did it come from? Where is it going? And what port number or service is it using? And that's really all you need to know. And whether or not it's an established connection, TCP, right? If, if it's an established connection, it can be smart enough to allow traffic in both directions. So we build our access list, right? In this example, I'm letting all the traffic on port 80 go to a certain IP address from pretty much anything. Um, then I'm creating another rule that's going to deny pretty much everything else. Uh, and that's it, right? Pretty simple rule. And then I could create, and then they're gonna, it's going to get parsed top down, right? So first it's going to say, is it traffic on port 80 to this machine? Yes, I'm going to send it. Everything else, it's going to get dropped with the deny. And that's a pretty straight, you know, pretty basic rule that we have there for a Cisco firewall, for example. We're going to create a diff, uh, you know, additional access lists. And then eventually we're going to apply these access lists to specific interfaces on our router. And that's basically how you configure a router in Cisco. And to an extent, this is how firewalls work with Cisco as well, although they have, you know, more granular controls and, uh, and, and configurations that you can do uh, and do more interesting things. But at, at its basic level, this is pretty much how it works. Now, IP tables is a little bit different. Uh, it has uh, it, it just it's a different concept, right? It's just it, it works a little bit different on paper. Um, basically, you have a network interface card. The traffic comes in on and you have a post routing and a pre routing processor. So basically, when data comes in, it's going to go to the pre routing processor. That's going to go into IP and IP. The IP processor is going to basically look at that data and say, is this data that is destined for me? Or is it data that is destined for someone else? Um, thing you have to remember about Linux is that it is both a network device in some cases, or a router like a router or a firewall, or it is the destination because it is a server running something like a firewall, or I'm sorry, like a, a web server or a email server or a DNS server, or LDAP server, right? Authentication, whatever, right? Linux is pretty versatile. It does a lot of different things. So it could be a network device. If it's a network, if it's operating as a network device, a lot of the traffic that comes in on a NIC is going to, it's going to detect that, hey, wait a minute, this traffic is not really for me. Uh, it's actually, I'm going to forward this to somebody else. So it's going to go to the forward chain. The forward chain is then going to have a set of rules to decide what to do with that packet. And it's going to send it to post routing and then it's going to send, go back out the NIC, right? If that traffic is an IP address that is destined for that Linux machine itself, it's going to go to an input chain. The input chain is then going to send it to a process if it passes the rule, right? So there's going to be a rule that says if traffic comes in and it's for port 80, it's going to allow it to go to a process listening on port 80, like Apache, for example. But if it's, say, traffic coming in on port 25 and there is no you know, we have a rule that says don't let anything into this machine on port 25, it's going to drop that uh, that datagram, right? So it's going to go to a process. Processes can also generate uh, datagrams. And when they do that, when a process generates a datagram that has to leave the machine, it's going to go into the routing chain. The routing chain is then going to send it to the output chain. The output chain, if the rules are going to allow that traffic, it's going to go to the post routing. And again, it's going to route out the NIC. So when we operate as a firewall, we're primarily using the forwarding chains. If we're operating as a application server, we're primarily looking at input and output chains. If it's some kind of you know server on our network, um, really, 
we have to worry about both no matter what, but that's really kind of where our focus is going to be depending on how we're using Linux. Um, so forward chains are basically for packet filtering on a network, right? It allows you to use your, your Linux machine as a firewall, as a network firewall or a router, right? Or both. Uh, the input chains are for things coming into our processes on our server itself and output is things that are leaving our server, right? If we're you know, responding to somebody or if we're, you know, initiating traffic on our Linux server. If you want to look at IP tables on your Linux machine, you can run the command sudo, obviously, because you have to run it as root. Uh, but it's IP tables dash capital L and it's going to list the uh, IP tables rules and the various chains. You can see here there's an input chain on here and the input chain is going to control, you know, certain ports. So here we have port 22 and port 80 are allowed into my server. So I'm allowing SSH and my machine is running as a web server, so it's also allowing port 80 into the server. And that's pretty much it, right? Um, so pretty basic. Now the thing is, this is a lot more complicated than working with Cisco's uh, ACLs, access control lists, right? It's a little bit more complicated. So um, to that end, how does this work in reality? Well, you know, IP tables is at the